let's get started. Uh, course announcements. First of all, office hours are again right after class. Um, on the problem set, feel free to use strong duality without a proof since we did cover it in class. Are there any questions? These are actually not bunnies. Like they're not um, young rabbits. They're just a kind of rabbit that's really small. It's called a pygmy rabbit. I'm sure you all want to know. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so let's go through Dijkstra's algorithm again. And let's actually have a proof of this. So the algorithm, as we discussed it before, was we maintain guesses for, we're, first of all, what's the point here? The point is we're trying to get the shortest, the distance, the length of the shortest paths from a single source vertex S to all the other vertices in the graph. We know the distance to S itself is just zero. We want to work out the distances to all the other vertices in the graph. So we're going to maintain guesses for the distances of all the vertices. And we're going to just continually update these guesses over the course of the algorithm. Now we start out with everything at infinity. And then at each step, we take the, vertice, the, the last vertex that we added. And so we, we start out with S. So we take, the, so you take S and we say, OK, what's the closest? Um, what, 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 are the, what are all the vertices um, distances from, from S? Um, and let's replace any distances um, by the, the, the distance from S. The distance, the distance at S plus the edge weights. So here we're updating infinity by zero, which is at S, plus five, which is the which is the weight of the edge between S and in this case Y. So we have zero plus five is five. Zero plus ten is ten. Zero plus seven is seven. We do the same thing for the next vertex. This next vertex is five. Uh, uh, sorry, how do we pick the next vertex? We pick the next vertex whatever has the smallest Yes. So we've updated to five, seven, and eight. And so we pick now five. We say, OK, well, uh, oh, sorry. The, the reason why uh, we shouldn't have updated to seven is, um, I apologize. This, was, this edge is directed the other way. That was why I was confused. So we update only two vertices in this particular example. I'm sorry for confusing everybody. We update only five. We only, only update these two. This becomes five. This becomes 10. This edge is going the other way, so there isn't a path from S to this vertex. So now we pick whichever has the smallest value out of those we've, we haven't visited yet. So this is 5. Um, and then we compute the same thing again. We say, OK, what are the neighbors of this vertex Y? Well, they're this, this, and this. We're going to update all of those. 5 plus 3, this edge distance, is 8. 8 is smaller than 10, so we're going to update it by 8. Now, let's try going to this vertex. Well, 5 plus 9 is 14, so this becomes 14. It was previously infinity. 5 plus 2 is 7, so this becomes 7 instead of infinity. What's the smallest of these? Well, it's 7, so we go to 7 next. We go to 7, and we say, OK, let's try updating all the neighbors of 7. What are the neighbors of 7? Well, 7 has neighbors this vertex, which was our original vertex, S. And so we could get to S by a path of 5 plus 2 plus 7, which would be 14. But we already know we can get to S by just 0. So the shortest path that we have so far to S is 0. So we don't update S. But we do update this one, because we have a path 5 plus 2 plus 6, which is 13. Um, and so since 13 is less than 14, which was our previous shortest path, we say, OK, this becomes 13. And then the, the next we explore 8. And then when we've explored 8, 
we get this estimate down to nine because we have a short we have a path five three one and this becomes nine and so that is our that is the, the finishing the exploration of the of the graph. Does anyone have questions about the algorithm itself? I mean, we maintain guesses for distances for all vertices from S. We start out with infinity everywhere, when S is at distance zero from itself. At each step, we pick an unvisited vertex with the smallest distance estimate, starting with S. And this estimate has to be correct. And this is what we need to prove formally. We visit all of its neighbors and we update the distances um, of the neighbors to the minimum of what they were before and the new estimate obtained by going via i. And we repeat this. How do we know when we are done is a question. How do we know when we're done? I will turn that around on the class. Keep on visiting a vertex. And we pick the minimum distance vertex. Yeah, when we visited all the vertices, at each point, there is going to be some vertex which has the minimum distance. Because it's a connected graph, you can show that none of the vertices, that you're never going to be in a situation where you have to pick a vertex that has distance infinity. Because there's always going to be some neighbor of something that you haven't visited. That's just because the graph is connected. What are, are there any other questions about the algorithm itself? We're basically just sort of discovering new paths and hoping that when we pick a vertex, the path that we found there is actually the shortest path. So for example, when we picked eight, when the, the vertex labeled eight, um, it was because we found a path five and three. So we knew that it, the distance there was, it, was uh, no more than eight because there was a path of distance eight. But we, we need to prove that that actually is the shortest path at each point. So we're going to prove that now. But um, there's a question about the time complexity of the algorithm. Um, we will get to that as well. Is a vertex visited if it's marked to dark? Um, what about the vertices that have path cost guesses but are not marked dark? Yes. So there are two kinds of visiting, basically. There, it, 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 when, when I'm saying visiting, I mean that you like actually add it to the list of vertices that you visited. But when you visit a vertex, you update the estimates for all of its neighbors. And those do not become visited vertex vertices. They just become sort of updated vertices. So here, for example, it might, it might have all of the vertices be its neighbors, and you update all of them, but you only visit the min distance one next. So basically, this, the, the highlighted edges indicate edges that you've explored. And the highlighted, the black vertices, or the gray vertices before they become black, but the, the, the highlighted vertices represent vertices you've explored. And so you can see that basically you're going through the graph and you are, um, you are um, exploring new, um, new edges each time. And you're adding a new visited vertex each time. Does that make sense? Does it matter which vertex you do next among the ones you visited at the last? So the vertex you do, ne do next is not technically a visited vertex. So, so here, for example, we started out with 0. And then we, went, and then we explored 10 and uh, the, the one that's a distance 10 and the one that's a distance 5. Though those aren't the they will end up being a shorter, shorter path to the one of distance 10. We ended up visiting t and y. Um, now, um, we have to visit the closer one first. And the reason we have to visit the closer one first is because there, the one that's further away, there could be a shorter path there. So if we visited this one, which is currently labeled 10, we would have not seen that there is a path 5, 3, which actually makes it distance 8. At each point, we want our estimate of the distance of the vertex we're, we're adding to be the correct estimate. So we know that 0 is a correct estimate for the distance at the source vertex. And we know that the closest vertex is definitely, you know, you know if there's a, a vertex at a, a, a distance 5, and there's no vertex closer than 5, then we, we saw last time that the shortest path to this vertex does have to be that 
single edge of length phi, but only for the one that's closest. And likewise, at each point, we're only, we're, we have to move to the vertex, which has the closest distance estimate. So here we have to move to 8 instead of 13. And here we have to move to 7 instead of 8 or 14. Does that make sense? So if you visit t before y, then you could get to the answer, but it would take longer. No, the algorithm wouldn't work. And let, let's see why. Suppose that, suppose that you um, did it that way. You would have, this is a really good question. Suppose that you, did, you visited them all, but out of order. Suppose you went to, to, to this vertex. Well, you would, have, um, you would have come up with the wrong estimate here when you were trying to work out the distance here. So let, let, let me explain that. Suppose that you visited t. If you visited t, you would say, uh, before visiting y, you would say, okay, distance to t is 10. Therefore, my estimate for the distance to x is 10 plus 1, which is 11. In fact, there's a shorter path, which is distance 9, 5, 3, 1. But you would never see that because the only time you update x from t, you would have had the wrong estimate at t. Does that make sense? So the, you need to do them in order, or some of your estimates will be wrong. That's just an example. Let's actually see a proof of why this, why this works. Um, and there's a question. So the node you're visiting has a distance, which, is, which lower bounds all the unvisited ones. Exactly that. The node, the node you visit is, has a distance which is lower than all the ones you are choosing not to visit. Or it's maybe there might be a tie, in which case it doesn't matter which one you pick. OK. So let's, let's see a proof of correctness. This is just an outline. If you were actually trying to write it down, then you would have to do it this more formally. Just for clarity, on the problem set, I'm not asking you to write down a formal proof here. Um, so what general technique might we use here? Um, and again, the thing that we're trying to prove that I'm just gonna, that I'm gonna say is like, when we add a vertex, we, are, we have the correct estimate for it. If we can prove that, then we're done. Because then we end up having correct estimates for everything. We're trying to prove that when we add a, 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 a vertex, it has to have the correct estimate. So I personally wouldn't use a monovariance approach because monovariance are generally useful in showing that something ends. And here we know that the algorithm ends. We're just going to find, we're going to go through all the vertices. Um, here we need to show that we've gotten the correct distance for something. So there might be like, uh, there, this sort of is kind of like an induction proof. The way I'm going to do this is actually by contradiction. Um, well, let's use contradiction, but again, there are lots of different ways to, to prove this. And this, this whole thing is inductive. It's like a, it's a recursive algorithm. So it's a basically an, an induction. So suppose that we've estimated the distance from S to, uh, to some vertices. And let's call F of V um, the estimate of the distance to a vertex V. So for example, F of Y is equal to five, F of Z is equal to seven. So at any point, we have f of v is greater than or equal to the actual distance. Why is that? Because we got it from creating some path between s and v. So here we got 7 by saying, OK, 5 and 2. There might be a shorter path, but there certainly is a path of 5 plus 2. So suppose when we visit some new vertex, our estimated distance is actually not correct. Like in that, that means that we, we have 
f of, of, of u, if u is our bad vertex, being strictly greater than the correct distance. We know it's greater than or equal to, but if it's not equal to it, then it means it's strictly greater. And let, let u be the first one of these bad vertices that we visit. Okay. Suppose that we have some vertices that we visited before you. I mean, we definitely had some vertices that we visited before you. Let S be the set of those vertices. There is some shortest path between S and U just in the graph. Let's see what this is. S is in S. So this path starts out in S. This is the path. And these are the highlighted vertices, the vertices we've already visited. And these are some new vertices so before, we, before we visit y, uh, before we visit u. So let x be the last vertex of the path that is in S, and y be the vertex right after that. So this is immediately where it transitions from the vertices we've visited to the vertices we haven't visited. So let's think about the path up through y. So this actually has to be the shortest path from s to y. Or else, we can make the path to u even shorter. We could just take a shortcut to y and then go even shorter to u. But we've assumed this is the shortest path. So that means that we have um, that means that we have the distance from s to y being just the distance from s to x plus this weight, right? That's just what it means that this is the shortest path. But we know that the estimates that we had were correct for everything before u. And in particular, it was correct for x. So that means, sorry, I sort of left out a step, but this, this is dsx is equal to f of x. Which means, that our estimate for y, when we explored x, when we visited x, sorry, when we visited x, we would have explored this edge and we would have given this, we would have already assigned y, the estimate, the correct estimate, right? Because we know that, th th that we already had the correct estimate for x. And so we got, we explored every edge from x, and so we would have gotten the correct estimate for y. So f of y equals the, dist the true distance from s to y. OK. How do we finish? It's still not easy. I'm just letting you think about it.
again, what we found, what we assumed was that you had an incorrect um, estimate, and it was the first, the first one. The first one where we were about to visit it, and it had an incorrect estimate. There's a question. We know the path to y must be shortest because we assumed y uh, u is the first incorrect um, vertex. No, because we assumed this is the shortest path to u. So if we could do a shortcut at any point in the path, then we could make the path to u shorter. Are there any other questions about what we've done so far? I really don't like writing proofs over Zoom because I try to I try to um, I try to compress them into a single slide. But really, this should be on an entire board. I'm really sorry. What does it mean to be a bad vertex? Um, sorry, um, just that the estimate of it is wrong when we're about to visit it. So, like, if if suppose that we, I, I, sorry, I didn't actually define that. If you were writing a proof, you would probably say, suppose that, a, or let's say, say that a vertex is bad if it is, its estimate is, if, if we have an incorrect estimate right before we visit it. So like, for example, suppose that we're about to visit this vertex, which we think has distance eight. It's the minimum of all these things. So we're supposed to visit it next, but actually there's a shorter path. Then it's a, then it's a bad vertex. We're trying to prove that there aren't any bad vertices. We're trying to prove that they're all that they're always when we're about to visit something, we have the correct estimate. Does that make sense? So we're now assuming we are about to visit you, but the estimate is wrong. So you is the, yes, you is the minimum among unvisited vertices. Exactly. We're assuming that. So let's see what happens. Because we know we have the correct estimate for y, but let's see what these let, let's see what, what, what our estimates are for y versus u. We know that the estimate for u is strictly bigger than the true distance because it's incorrect. We were assuming that in but to Quartz contradiction that u was a bad vertex, a vertex where our estimate was wrong. That means our estimate is greater, strictly greater than the correct distance. But the correct distance to u is actually at least as big as the correct distance to y because there was more path to travel between y and u. But the correct, but the, S, the distance to y is equal to our estimate for y because we just showed that it is. But that means that our estimate for u is bigger than our estimate for y. So, what happens then? Remember, y is another unvisited vertex here. It's a contradiction. We should be visiting y instead of u. Yeah. So there, there is a vertex y, which is unvisited, which has a lower estimate. f of y is strictly less than f of u. So why aren't we visiting y instead of u? This is a contradiction because we assumed that u was the, 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 um, the vertex we were going to visit next. So that means that whenever we visit a vertex, our estimate f is exactly the correct distance. And that means that the entire algorithm proceeds as we want because once we've sort of set one of those distances in stone, we just can go through all the vertices in the graph. And then the final vertex, we also have the correct estimate. And so every one of our estimates is correct. Are there questions? I do suggest staring at this proof afterwards. This is one of those proofs that once you get it, you will, you, you will, it will click. Um, but 
until that happens, it, will, it, it can be really confusing. And again, I'm not going to ask you to like write down a formal, a formal version of this, but it does really help to understand something. Okay. Are there any questions? Is it simple to prove this via induction? So what would be the inductive statement that, the, that each distance th that you are um, adding is the correct one? I mean, it would probably end up being a very similar proof. You'd probably end up having a contradiction within it, I think. Like oftentimes you start out with different ways. You, you, you think that you're doing a different proof, but it turns out that it's actually secretly the same proof. I know that, yeah, I don't know that doesn't necessarily make sense, but like, yeah. If you try doing this with induction, you probably end up doing the same thing, I think. The key point in this proof, which is a key point in, in general is like, in this kind of in, in in this kind of contradiction, you you show that you would have had to have done that, that, that something else would have had to have happened earlier, essentially. So here we looked at our, our vertex u and we were like, well, what if that estimate was wrong? Let's look at something else that happened earlier in the, 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 that is that is yeah that happened earlier where we updated this this estimate for y. We actually had the correct estimate for y. So why didn't we go there? Any more questions? Okay. Let us move on. How long does it take? Any guesses? We didn't prove how long this takes at all. Does anyone have like an upper bound for how long it might take? And be careful if you use n, just to, it, like I'm, there is a number of vertices in a graph and there's a number of edges in a graph. And typically the number of, of edges is larger than the number of vertices. Okay. There's, a, there's a suggestion of number of vertices times number of edges. We need to explore each single vertice, vertex's neighbors. Yeah, so I mean, theoretically, you could imagine like exploring number of edges for each of the vertices. Um, yeah, we can actually do it. It'll end up being more efficient than that, which is good. Um, let's see. Let's see what. Let's see how how well we can do it. So, let's work out what the components of this algorithm are. We have to work out the shortest distance from S to any of the unvisited vertices. We have to go through each of its neighbors and decrease some of their distances. And we have to remove a vertex from a list of unvisited vertices. How can we do this? Is there a good way? of doing this. Bringing out the shortest distance. Storing some values, sometimes decreasing them, finding a minimum fast and removing values one by one. It's a good way to do all these things. Hmm. Yes, so we can use a min heap. And specifically, we can use a min, like we, because a min heap can implement a min priority queue. 
So let's see what this, let's rephrase the algorithm now in, in heat terms. If there are um, the cardinality of V number of vertices and the cardinality of E number of edges, this is just um, set theoretic notation. So like the, 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 the lines just mean the size of the set of vertices, the size of the set of edges. In each step, um, we will run minimum takes O of V time. Sorry, I guess that takes O of one time. Sorry about that. <laughs> that, that that's a typo. Um, for each of the neighbors, you're going to run decrease key, potentially. You decrease the values at some of the neighbors. And that'll take O of log V time, because that's the number, the number of things in the, in the heap is V. And then we're going to extract the minimum. We didn't even really need to, we could have, we could have just run extract min. We didn't, I can, you can cross this out. Um, so you just decrease the key of all the neighbors and you extract the, the, the you extract the minimum, I guess, before you do that. And then you repeat. So have to run minimum and extract min v times. So um, uh, apologize, apologies for um, the, the minimum you don't really have to, to run. O of v log v, just this is running this for each of the, each of the vertices. How many times do you have to run decrease key? Once again, you're running decrease key every time you explore a neighbor and you, you, you say, oh, well, there might be a shorter path to my, to my, to my, my um, via, via the, the, the vertex I'm exploring. So like when you're running decrease key, when you say, okay, well, via five, I can get to here five and three. So decrease key from 10 to, 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 to eight. Decrease key here from eight, from infinity to fourteen. Decrease key here from infinity to seven. And so again, like each time I'm adding something, I'm put, calling something in black. I'm running extract min on the queue of things that I haven't visited yet, and I'm decreasing the key of some things. Yes, so sorry, let me, let me just type this. The heap is storing the vertices we haven't visited yet with their estimated distances. Just type that in the chat. How do you decrease from infinity? I mean, just make infinity something really large or define your operation from, it's, it's like it worked with the heap, it was fine. Okay, so how many times do you have to run decrease key? Decrease key if you explore this edge, this edge and this edge. Whenever you visit a new vertex, you have to decrease key maybe for each of its neighbors. So you're exploring all the edges coming out of that. So the number of times we have to run decrease key is just the number of edges in the graph because you run decrease key exactly when you explore an, a new edge. And so the number of times we have it is big O of number of edges times log of number of vertices.
One moment. Sorry about that, technical issue. Um, yeah, so the total amount of time is going to be the sum of these things, which is big O of size of V plus size of E all times log of V. Why is this equal to big O of size of E times log V? Yeah, so you have big O of f plus g. If you have two functions, f and g, you have big O of f plus g is just equal to big O of the bigger one. And we know that the cardinality of e, the number of edges, is at least the, the number of vertices minus one because the graph is connected. And in fact, the number of edges could be um, up to the square of the number of vertices. So theoretically, this could be as bad, you know, for, for a dense graph, you could have this be as bad as this. Though actually there's a way to do it much faster or somewhat faster. This is, a, this is still Dijkstra's algorithm, it's just, an implementation that uses what's called a Fibonacci heap, which is a more efficient way to do a priority queue. Other questions? confusions, things that, things that were particularly confusing from that. Can we formalize the inductive step in, in Dijkstra's algorithm? Um, so you, you mean like the, the algorithmic step? So the, the algorithm is written down here, maintain guesses for all dis for distances from all, of all vertices from S. Start out with infinity everywhere, S at different as distance zero. At each step, you pick an un the unvisited vertex with the smallest distance estimate, starting with S. And we claim that this estimate has to be correct. This is what we prove. We visit all its neighbors and we update the distances according to this. And then we repeat until we're done. That is the inductive step index algorithm. The proof itself didn't use induction. There wasn't an inductive step in the in the proof. The proof was simply contradiction. We assumed that there was a vertex where it wasn't correct. We, we found the first one where it wasn't correct. We showed that actually, because it wasn't correct, there had to have been some vertex before it, which we would have visited first. And so we wouldn't have actually visited you, the, the, this vertex U next. Okay. Whew. That was a lot of, a lot of stuff distilled into uh, a, very, a very short amount of space and time. Um, I, I'm definitely trying to cover a lot in this course. So don't worry if some of it feels really intense. Like there could be an entire class on graph algorithms. And I'm trying to compress a lot of things um, with, without your having 
done all of the background that you would normally do for something like this. I want you to get a flavor of these things. You're not gonna in future need to like go and prove Dijkstra's algorithm probably, but having a sense of why it is true and going through the steps that would be necessary to prove it is just a useful, useful thing in, in, in learning how to think about these things. So now let's, let's see a, a, another cool thing about shortest paths before we, before we turn to, to minimal spanning trees. Shortest paths is a linear program. Suppose we want the shortest path from between S and T. This is not the, um, the, 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 the formulation that we were looking at a moment ago where we, we said we pick a vertex S and we want the, the, distant, the shortest paths to all of the other vertices. Here we just want the shortest path between two particular vertices. There is actually a way to express this as a linear program. This is not the way you would actually probably want to solve it, um, but the, this is the linear program. And it actually is sort of the way you want to solve it, though it, like, I'm not going to go into this, but in some sense, if you look at, if you try to solve the dual of this linear program, well, we'll see what the linear program is in a moment. If you try to solve the dual of this linear program, there's a way to solve it that is basically just using Dijkstra's algorithm. There's a way to interpret solving the dual linear program as Dijkstra's algorithm. Okay. Um, so let us, let us go through what this linear program is. The intuition is that we have some variables x, i, j, that we would like to be one, they're indicator variables, we'd like them to be one if edge i, j is in this shortest path and it's otherwise zero. And there's a variable x, i, j for every one of the edges in the graph. So many of the variables are going to be zero. Most of the variables are going to be zero, probably. And some of them are going to be one. And those are just the ones we want on, on the shortest path. That's what we want. The objective is the weight of the sum, the, the sum of the weights of all the edges in the path. So that sort of makes sense. If you could say, well, this, these indicative variables are a shortest path, then you would just say minimize this the sum of weights. Now, but you do need to, you need to encode the fact that they form a shortest path. And so this, these constraints are basically encoding the fact that they form a shortest path. Now, what is this constraint? Well, this constraint's easy. It's just saying it's, it's they're greater than or equal to zero. What about this constraint? This is saying that if you pick a, if you pick an index J, a vertex J, that isn't the source of the sink, that isn't S or T, then the net vertices coming in, this is the number of, ver this is the number of edges, sorry, the number of edges coming in minus the number of edges going out is equal to zero. That means you have the same number of edges coming into any vertex as going out, unless the vertex is T, in which case you have one more vertex coming in, and unless the vertex is S, where you have one more vertex coming out. So you can think of this intuitively. I'm not going to prove this. You can think of this intuitively as saying there's a flow along edges from S to T, and the um, the net number of edges coming out of, of S is one, and the net number of edges coming into T is one. And everywhere else, the edges are exactly balanced. <coughs> now, this is not exactly the same as saying it's a shortest path. For example, if you had two shortest paths, uh, well, sorry, if you had, if you, if you had a, a, a solution here, you, you could end up having some of these x's not be one or zero. You could have an, a, a, an xij. There's nothing saying that xij has to be one or zero here. You could have an xij be two, or you could have it be one half. You could have a fractional combination of paths. And actually, that would be possible. Just, you would have a feasible solution if you took 
the variables for path P1 and P2, and you did one half times the, the solution for P1 plus one half times the solution for P2. This should give you another solution to this. So that there, there are many ways to create feasible points that satisfy, so satisfy all of these constraints. Needn't be a shortest path. But <coughs> there is a way to show that there must exist at the optimum of this, that the optimum of the linear program occurs at many different points potentially, but it occurs at at least one point, which is a shortest path. And here's sort of the intuition for that. If you had any edge be taken more than once, then that would be wasteful. You wouldn't be minimizing this. You could decrease the amount on that. You could decrease the, this sort of useless edge and you would end up with a, short, a smaller objective value. And if you had a fractional combination of two paths, then you would end up with the average of the two ob uh, objectives. So if you had P1 and P2, then the objective value for one half P1 plus one half P2 would be the, would be the average of the objective values one half objective value for P1 plus one half the objective value for P2. And so um, if one half objective one plus one half objective two is, minim is the minimum, then both objective one and objective two would have to be the minimum. This is an intuition. If you didn't get that, don't worry. But it's basically saying if you took the same edge more than once, you can remove it. And if you took a fractional combination of paths that give you an optimum, then one of those paths has to be at least as small as the fractional combination. Because if you take an average of some things, the minimum of those things is going to be less than or equal to the average. The reason I'm not writing this in a formal proof is because that's not quite a formal proof. And there is a bunch more that's necessary before it becomes a formal proof. So I didn't want to sort of, I wanted to just give you a little bit of intuition for it. But the moral of the story is that if you, if you write down this linear program, there are feasible points, which are not shortest paths. There are feasible points where the xij are not zero or one, but there is an optimum where the xij are all zero or one. And that corresponds to a shortest path between S and T. Okay, and then one final thing I wanted to, to indicate here is that in general, what we have here is the, what we would like is an integer linear program. We'd like a solution to this where these are, cons where the XIJs are constrained to be integers. In general, it is not true that the solution to an L to a linear program. With, uh, sorry, this is this is called an integer linear program. If you constrain the the variables x i j to be integers, it is in general not true that an integer linear program can be reduced to a linear program. In this particular case, it can be. Integer linear programs are in general much harder than linear programs. But in this particular case. We have an integer linear program where the optimum is the same as the optimum if you just made it a linear program. Okay, are there questions about this? Would the simplex algorithm solution to this LP give integer x i j? I believe it would. Not totally sure though. It's a very good question. I think there will be a rounding procedure that you could do though to give you an integer solution probably. 
So even if you got a non-integral solution, you could round it, but I don't know. Once again, if you try to solve the dual of this linear program, there, it ends up, there's a, a way to do it, which ends up being quite natural, which is, which is just equivalent to Dijkstra's algorithm. But I'm not going to go through that. You will not be tested on this. I will stick around for questions and there are office hours. Here is a poll about the speed of class. 